Hello, this is Andrea Miller, Open Relationships Transforming Together host. We are back. We have the most amazing guest with us today, Stan Tatkin. Stan is the is a teacher, clinician, researcher, and developer of the psychobiological approach to couples therapy, aka Raconteur. Pact and Rock on Tour, <laughs> yes. And founder of the Pact Institute. Stan speaks and teaches around the world, is an assistant clinical professor at the UCLA David Geffen School of Medicine, and the author of many best selling books, including the seminal Wired for Love How Understanding Your Partner's Brain and Attachment Style Can Help You Diffuse Conflict and Build a Secure Relationship which was originally published in 2012 and is just about to be re-released next week. Congratulations. That's yes. awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I got to add to that though, Stan. Gwyneth Paltrow has high praise for you. Invaluable for so many partners looking to reconnect and grow closer together. That's what she says about Wired for Love and, not to be outdone, the one and only Alanis Morissette says Stan Tatkin can be entirely followed into the towering infernos of our most painful relationship challenges. I just, I wanted to ask, when someone is in that towering inferno, when they feel yeah. their partner just does There's a movie about that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. That that's gonna that's gonna follow this pod. No, but in all seriousness, when they feel their partner just doesn't understand them, and that they're at the end of their rope, I mean, what do you recommend to them? Because uh, that's, I mean, lawyer? that we've all been there. Oh, a lawyer. <laughs> well, I, you know. Uh, oh boy. Uh, <laughs> uh, end of their end of their rope, and you know it, it, everything. <laughs> You know, this is this is about uh, partnership agreements, and if if you have a partner who is not a fair player and doesn't want to play fair and square, is uh, uh, you know someone who wants to do everything solo, and you didn't sign on for that, then and they're not willing to do anything other than that, then there's really nothing to do except to say, "Love you, but you know." But still, uh, there's this thing happening and people are talking about a lot, like on TikTok, of so many women are so fed up with their husbands not participating in the family, not contributing, even just being emotionally shut down. And they they plant, they say, I'm going to leave. I'm going to leave. They might even say that for years. And then as their bags are packed, these husbands are surprised. And it, to, uh, what is happening with that? Like, how could that be? Because... Uh, we are naturally opportunistic if we can, uh, you know, it's a good gig if you can get it kind of thing. Uh, if I can get away with something, I'll do it. Uh, you might wish that we were of higher character and better. And, but no, uh, we learn uh, that we can't do that because someone proves it. So, Is it conscious? You know, like, are they consciously like, she doesn't mean she's going to leave. She's not serious until they see the bags or get that contact with a lawyer or is it more subconscious no it's it's absolutely right out there uh, it's like with your your kids uh, if you say hey uh, you can't do that and then you let them do it now they know they can you can be as angry as you want but they people can tolerate being angry but uh, but you leave the premises, or you cannot do that with your kid. But uh, but you know if you pack your bags uh, as a demonstration, um, uh, yeah, I'm serious about this. That gets a message across. If your bags are empty and they're caught, uh, <laughs> you're in so big I, trouble. But but let me ask you that: How often in your many years of practice and um, you know helping so many thousands of people? Um, how often do you find that when they get to that point, the bags are actually packed, that it's not a head fake anymore, that they, um, things can be repaired? Well, the, let's talk about 
attachment biology. So attachment biology is the I can't quit you biology, right? It keeps us glued to each other for the most part, most of us. And so that's really good for us being herd animals and grouping together and unionizing and staying together for kids and stuff like that. But it also can mislead us and make us stick around thinking it's about love when it isn't just like attachment really isn't about love. Uh, it's about safety and security. And, uh, and the attachment biology here is, is a primitive primal survival instinct that goes all the way back to infancy um, that if I lose this primary attachment figure, I die. And that's what it feels like, even though intellectually we know that's not true, but there's always that part of us that goes, why, 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 right? No matter how much we talk to it, and so uh, that becomes a problem because then we put loss, fear of loss over principle, fear of loss over what is best, what is good, what is right. And that's both parties, right? So, um, so th this is a matter of two people, you know, wanting the same thing first. Uh, if they want two different things, that won't work. They have to want the same things and keep checking, rechecking that they're talking about the same thing but also willing to enforce that, uh, that you know, uh, we have equity, uh, parity, we have the same things to gain, same things to lose. You can't do that. I can't do that. It's mutually assured destruction if we do that. And that's why I like, um, I like the field to be leveled, um, as it should be with two adults coming together based on terms and conditions, right? Free and fair. Um, strangers, right? And always, they don't know each other anything. There's no entitlement. Uh, this is, uh, this is, I do this, you do this. This is how we survive. This is how we thrive. And, um, and, and we have, uh, you know, we could hurt each other in the same ways. Okay. Uh, I, I agree with that. But to, so I guess, and, and you, you, answered it. I kind, right. of lost, I to... kind of lost the question, but well, yeah, no, back, I mean, back, to the, back to the point, <laughs> back to the attachment biology. And yes, I mean, what? I wholeheartedly agree with, um, in an ideal world, having those agreements and so forth. I mean, it reminds me, my dad loves to say the bet, you know, talking about the best time to plant a tree 40 years ago, second best time today. Right. I use that metaphor all the time. <laughs> it feels I like, like it. it is so yeah, it's it's like, oh, crap, I, I failed, but I don't have to keep failing, right? In, you know, and all these different things should have, should have, should have done it before. So now the, the second best time to um, come to that agreement and to, to get on the same page, I guess I'm asking is, and I, I hear you, attachment biology will keep us together um, probably for the wrong reasons. Do you see very- oh, I didn't remember what your question oh. was. <laughs> oh, let's see. Show me <laughs> touch of, a touch of dementia there. Um, no, okay, so, so, much to say. Uh, so so what? Why would that work? Why would that work? Because I'm betting that you are afraid of losing me as much as I'm afraid of losing you. So the attachment biology is the right. It's going to keep us in. So I'm going to throw down um, uh, in in good faith, believing in something that is good for me and good for you, right? You can't do this bad if I do it, bad if you do it. So I'll show you, you can't do that. I just won't be here when you get home or your things will be out on, on the street. Uh, but either way, I'm going to incrementally withdraw to show you that this will not stand, right? It won't work, right? I'm protecting the union since you aren't. Uh, and so it's a good faith act and it's the it's the nonviolent way to protest is to withdraw for a purpose, a stated purpose, and to do it incrementally in phases so it's not interpreted as punishment, right? And so so we're, I'm talking about when it's gone way too far. And what does happen in situations like this, the person who gets it that there is no other, this cannot happen. I've lost the relationship I've already lost, right? Now this question of, can I buy back in? Because these relationships are pay to play. So um, that then inspires me as the person who's been, you know, taking advantage, let's say, um, having uh, certain privileges and uh, not taking them seriously. Now I have to really think about 
do I want to change my ways and and come together or am I willing to lose this relationship? And, and how, how people, frequently, you know, okay, okay, maybe you're about to, okay, so how frequently when people get to that stage, do is there a turnaround or is it, you know what, once you're foot and a half out the door, it's done? Or is there a third, a third option? It, it really, a lot of this, a lot of this is tactical. A lot of this is how it's played by the person who is throwing down. They're the linchpin, and I, you know, it's it's kind of tough, right? If I'm going to make a change, I have to be willing to lose things, right? So you I'm have to going go all to, the way. You have to be willing to go, to all, go the way. all the way. Mm -hmm. That's why I say it's a good faith effort. I'm not trying to end the relationship. I'm trying to show you that I will not continue under those circumstances. It's bad for me and bad for you. Unsustainable, can't work. I'm showing you now because I want a good life. And so should you want a good life? What would right? you say to those men that are in that position? And I'm sure sometimes it's and women, women too. too. Yes. But, but what would you say to that partner who's in that position where they are hearing that their partner is unhappy? They are hearing that their partner is contemplating leaving and they're just riding it out to see if it's true. Like, what would you say in that moment? Yeah, because it's often asymmetric, right? That's the problem. It's way yeah, it's, often you know, asymmetric. One person's like, good enough for me. And the other person's like, not for me. What, what, if, what would I tell your child um, if you keep moving the line and you don't, uh, you don't demonstrate boundaries, you don't demonstrate that there are limits and you'll show this child that there are, not angrily, not angrily, just show them there is. No, right? I mean, what would you as a therapist that we're but, but in I'm, your but, office? But I'm saying, okay, good. I'm saying yeah. that would be like me telling the person who believes they can do this, even though their partner is unhappy, would be like telling your child, you can do this. You know, it's making your mom unhappy. You know, it makes her, it makes her cry at night. And, and, and it's such messy for you because you have to deal with this angry mother. Do you really want to keep behaving this way? Kids gonna go, yeah. Um, so, <laughs> you know, oh my, my kids. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Hello. <laughs> we are not in theoretical um, world here, people. This is real life. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's it's you know, you, I I stop when I find that I I can't do this, and and the, and you're showing me I can't do this. Uh, you know, cake or death. I give you up or I give this up. So, so there is nothing to say to that person. The person I have to really work with is the person who is wanting the change, who cannot tolerate this. It's not livable. It's not fair. It's not just. It's not sensitive. It's, right? It can't work. And so they're the linchpin, and that's when they have to show up as co-general, co-owner of the business, co-executive, and say, nah, do that, and no deal. Right? Mm -hmm. No deal. Yeah, and you can't um, blink, right? You can't blink. But it's so admirable, and when people do this, it it actually creates a tremendous amount of respect by the other person. It does. What happens when you don't follow through, when you don't stand up to me, is I lose respect for you, just like I lose respect for my parents that I can manipulate. Think about that. Think about the parents who you could manipulate. You won, but you lost, because your parents are idiots. They're in. They're, inc they're incompetent. They're weak. Uh, there is no God. You know. Uh, talk about. We were talking about narcissism pre-show, but you know how does narcissism then uh, develop trajectory? You know, in terms of trajectory, that's one of the ways. Um, and so, me, me, hang on. Let me just, just let me just make sure uh, I understand that. Narcissism develops. Are you saying with uh, your ability to manipulate parents? And that you become to you know you you become prone to lack respect and so forth. Um, one way there's two major ways to develop this. One major way is I'm the second coming, right? Um, I'm Freud. I'm you know I'm whoever that that I can do no wrong. I'm the golden child. And with parents that are this way, this is what Alice Miller wrote about drama, the gifted child. Oh God, uh, Alice Miller. Who, 
they'll live through their child and they won't say no and they won't give them consequences. They won't show them that there is, that there is a container that keeps them safe and allows them to be free within the container. No container, no freedom. You're lost. But that's the feeling. Um, I, there is no God. I, you know, my parents are incompetent. Um, let's see who else is. And, uh, and then I start to press the limits. I start to think I'm very powerful. I, I begin to think the rules don't apply to me. And so that's a natural outcome from this Petri dish that is childhood, right? And the parents are, are playing the role of society and, and, sh and showing children you know, in a friendly way, what the unfriendly world is like so that we get along with other people, right? The other way, by the way, to develop this is to be, it's to be yourself a narcissist as a parent and to be a very, very harsh parent. So your the parenting style is overly harsh and, and that also consolidates a kind of narcissism well, that, as well. That whole business of the rules don't apply to me, no container means no freedom, how I mean that's like scary stuff. How frequently do you see that? And I realize you're mo you. I mean, and by the way, do you mostly? I, I I feel like you mostly do couples, but do you also end up by virtue of, um, uh, um, helping couples? Do you end up and seeing the whole? I guess you'd see the whole family unit. You know, I don't do that anymore. I if I see the family, I divide them into couples. <laughs> I divide them. I I divide them dyadically. And that works actually better in my. I mean, I'll 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 divide a, a father son father daughter, um, uh, uh, mother son mother daughter, um, a, a sister brother. Uh, you know, I'll I'll divide and conquer, uh, because when you have a whole system together, it operates as a system and is misleading and it's very hard because people will go right into their roles. When you divide them and make them a couple just as you would do couples, you get a much more alive, unpredictable, and more phenomenological system here that you're working uh, with the relationship, this relationship, not all the relationships. Oh my God, hang right? on. I just, I, I love this. And I just want to like marinate in this a little bit because, I, you know, I just, th that approach sounds so refreshing and new and maybe you've been doing it for a long time. But it, it really, it's so interesting, you know, to, for you to talk about how if you're doing it in the whole system, then it's in the roles, you know, everybody ends up staying um, calcified in their roles versus your uh, breaking down that that unit, that family unit into smaller bits. Yeah, it is. It's like a whole reframing, which and is, to talk about the roles and correct me if I'm wrong, Stan, I'm thinking of things like the golden child and the scapegoat. So if you've got that kind of function in your family, if you have, let's say, all four members of the family there, that golden child isn't going to be able to be authentic because they will be goldening and that scapegoat will be scapegoating. Yeah. And that's because we're, we're primarily dyadic creatures. We started off as a dyad, actually started off as a undifferentiated, uh, uh, you know, single cell organism. But, you know, we, uh, we, we begin to, through this mitotic process, psychologically, we begin to become dyadically focused with a primary. And then we go and then we expand to, uh, to thirds and fourths and so on. But we still pair bond in, in, uh, in diets, right? And that's pair bonding. And so, uh, and so there's, there's more power, I think, dyadically in the relationship and shifting people and in helping them differentiate, grow up, than there is in putting them in the group. Do you learn uh, something if you take that, let's say the golden and the really dysfunctional parent and you pair them versus the golden and the other parent and you learn something about what's actually happening? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and by the way, I'm saying the child should be of age, uh, old enough to be able to to think and to be able to uh, right is psychologically awake and able to stand on their own and so on. We're not talking about very young children. So, but teenagers, uh, basically. And so, yeah, it's a whole different dynamic and much easier to, to also get people into the office because hard to get, you know, eight people into an office at the same time, especially if they're around the world. And so, 
Uh, it's so easier to manage, and it doesn't take very long because you're working in an intensely dyadic way um, to sort of square things and uh, and uh, and also reframe things. Uh, so that that is how we start to be able to grow out of that system. Uh, we're still influenced by it, but we're not. You know, the system doesn't change. We have to. And that's usually done in individual therapy. So what is that? That's a dyadic situation. So, so uh, I think you know, breaking them into dyads works better and faster in my experience oh, that's than so seeing the whole family. That is so interesting and refreshing and feels like such a, um, just a, a novel, compelling way to, um, you know, to, to help. So, I mean, thanks for that. Okay, I just want to rewind for a moment though. Going back to, you know, one partner is, has a foot out the door. Bags are are actually packed. They're not they're not um, a decoy bags, you know, that are empty. Um, I was chatting with Harville the, Hendricks the other day, time. our mutual friend Harville, whom we love, yes, and I, I know love him. And he was talking about, you I know, mean, of course we were talking about relationships, and he was talking about he stopped me in my tracks. He was talking about how we co-create all of our relationships, which I do fundamentally believe in, but that is also at odds with, I think it's at odds, this idea that you're in a relationship and you're at the end of your rope and it's you, you're sure it's all about the other person. And then Harville says, not so fast. You're co-creating every relationship. What do you do, Stan? Do you unpack no your bags? Angel. I mean, what do you do? Is it no any? angel, no <laughs> angels, no devils. Uh, where there's one in couples, there's always the other. Uh, anybody who's been doing this knows this. Um, and so, yeah, it can't. It, this is a system. Um, these are people that picked each other based on recognition and familiarity. It's not an accident. And so, it looks like a duck, but it isn't. Um, and that's what we have to be aware of is to look both directions, right? Uh, like when you cross the street. However, having said that, that also pertains to making the relationship right itself. It takes at least one person to stand up for something that they believe is the best thing, the right thing, good thing to do. Um, and they're willing, they're willing to risk the relationship over that. We're not talking about what color to paint the wall. I'm not going to pack my bags over that. That would be, that would be diagnostic of something else, right? Um, uh, we're talking about a serious matter that is a deal breaker. A deal breaker cannot happen. Quality of life goes way down, and um, and you should keep your eyes open at night because this is too unfair. So, uh, right, this is a bad situation. That's when somebody has to act. And the way, the nonviolent way to do that is to withdraw because I can acclimate to your anger, right? Um, I still get what I want, still get away with it. I'm getting messages you can't leave because I'm on to you. You're afraid of losing the relationship. And so I can get away with this. The question is, am I afraid of losing the relationship? Because if I'm not, if I'm not, you don't really have anything. Yeah, there's no leverage. No leverage. And at you all. hate to think of it like that because it feels so manipulative, but it is constant it's not. teeter totter of balance. Yeah, it's not. It's not. Look, we're strangers. You know, I confuse you for a family member that does uh, that. <laughs> I thought I, I thought I knew you yeah. for twenty five years. Just kidding. I don't. Yeah. You're a stranger. No, you owe me nothing. We we don't. We can't come to the table with any entitlements. We're not entitled to anything. This is earned earned love, earned respect, earned trust, prove it, right? Because life is harsh and life is dangerous. I need to know who I'm in the foxhole with. And if I'm with someone who's going to cut and run, I'm an idiot. Or someone that's going to exploit you when you're down. It reminds me. Right. And say, they're the enemy. Yeah. I got, I was hostage. Yeah. yeah. It reminds Anything me like. a bit of, I was, speak. we have our sweet Sue Johnson who just passed away. We love beautiful Sue. I was revisiting Hold Me Tight, a book that she wrote, thinking about her after she passed. And it seems like there's this pattern where when a woman gets sick, and this is just 
observing from her stories in her book. A woman gets sick and the man freaks out and pulls away. Have you seen that pattern? It, I've observed it anecdotally. Too. What What's that about? I mean, that seems like one of those intolerable situations. You know, there are some differences in our culture between men and women, in our culture. Uh, you know, th there is this mama thing of, and, of being wanting to be cared for and loved and all sorts of things. When, you know, uh, women have some mixed up things as well. But a lot of this gets played out. Again, entitlement. You should take care of me. But if you're sick, uh, it interferes with my golf game. Uh, no. Um, and so it's, it, 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 you know, I'll, I'll, I'll see people who, you know, men that will visit their wives or be there uh, in hospital um, and turn on the TV and not really be present. Uh, and, and their wives would never do that. And, and I'll say, you know, do you think your you think your wife loves to come to the hospital and be with you and while you're sick and pay attention to you? Do you think that's really the that that you know, if it's a choice between going to the movies or being with a girlfriend or going for a trip, and now I'd like to go to my I'd like to cut off everything and go to the hospital and sit by my ailing husband. No, 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 no. And, and yet you uh, imagine that you shouldn't have to do this. Um, uh, and I say this mostly for my audience, who is the female, right? Because she's also allowing it. Yeah. Now that's, I mean, it's just, it really is about reclaiming your power. And when you're and not- Some people never, never, some people never had it or never claimed it. Um, and the and male and female, and they want it given to them. And that's just not how it works. Oh, I love that, Stan. That, I, that to me, I just have to say it. Power is never given. It's always taken. I mean, and that, that to me is, it's like, ooh. And I feel like especially a lot of young women need to hear that, right? Because that is, it, it can only come from within. And I've certainly experienced that as, you know, now a woman in my middle age and feeling frustrated at times, it's like, oh, why, why aren't more people doing things for me or recognizing me and so forth? And it's just like, no, that, that comes from within. Um, uh, Joanna, go ahead with your question. Then I, I have uh, something that I want to go on to next with. Oh you, yeah. Stan. I was going to say, I wonder also with men, if there's a thing about fear because, and I'll tell you a quick little story. Uh, I get, I've had a lot of skin cancer and I'm lucky I have a great doctor. It gets removed really fast and I've been fortunate, but I had a melanoma and it was on my foot and I had to have a whole reconstruction. So it was a big surgery. Okay. This was 10 years ago or 10 or more years ago. And I have this amazing husband, everyone who knows him. He's so kind. He's so present. There was something about it that he just, he couldn't, he couldn't engage with it. He couldn't feel bad for me. He didn't want to drive me to the doctor. And it's so unusual because if I was like, I need to be driven to the farmer's market to buy oranges, he'd drop everything, right? But then I needed real surgery. And it was like, he was grumpy. He was rude and not present. And he still, I mean, he feels badly. He wouldn't do that now. He still can't really explain why. But in my heart, I have felt like he doesn't know how to deal with fear. And he was afraid so is there something like that maybe with men too? Like it's scary and they're not. It, you know, um, if if somebody is in the distancing group in attachment, they're by nature avoidant and avoidant of pain, avoidant of painful affects, right? Um, it's, uh, they develop uh, an executive function that, that conspires to avoid pain, right? Uh, that's a good thing. Um, and and only seek pleasure or happiness, um, and that's not a, that's not a good way to live uh, because you can't be that happy if you can't feel pain. And also, it's it's not it's pro self. It's not pro social. It, it can't work in relationships, right? So it could be that this is something that does scare him and could lose you the big C cancer. Um, he doesn't like to see his uh, partner, his sweetheart, be cut up. Um, you know, and, um, and, and so it could be that I don't know him. Does, did he ever have anybody who died 
uh, had to, uh, right? Suffered yeah. loss. Yeah, his and mother had died of cancer so not long before that. Oh, God. So, well, there you go. Seems obvious, right? Yeah, there you go. Right. And and so, but here's what I'm going to say about that. In, in, in this world with couples, the way I view it, and, you know, not as an individual therapist, but as a couple uh, therapist, uh, it ultimately doesn't matter why you do what you do. If it's if it is bad for the union, you can't do it. If it is bad for if it's going to cause a disruption in uh, in the field, right? You can't do it because it's self harming. It's self harming. We're connected. Whatever I do to you happens to me. So I you know I can't just you know separate myself from you. We're interdependent. And so all I had, all I can do is make sure that I serve you and you serve me. Otherwise, we're going to fight. So in the attachment world, there are big, big ticket items that everyone needs to pay attention to. Birthdays, not so much. Maybe somebody has a particular thing about a birthday. But the one that's ubiquitous is pain and fear. So if, I, if, if you are afraid or in pain, I better be there and I better be effective. If you go to the hospital and you're terrified, I better be there and be supportive. If your father, parent, his loved one dies and you're going to the funeral, I better be there. If you're going to celebrate, you're getting an award, I better be there because these things are remembered and they're held as big high-weighted misses in the attachment world. They carry a lot of weight and people screw this up. Um, and so you should know, even if your partner says, Hey, you don't need to join me to the hospital. I know you're busy. Just go to work. I'll be fine. Mm -hmm. Don't listen to them. You Show don't. up. Yeah. For the, the you big, yeah. yeah, those, yeah. I have a visual of like a map of the world, but it's a map of your life together. And it's like a, those little push pins in those events. And we need to be there together for that. I love that. So what I would say to your husband at that time, if, if you were with there with me, uh, I would say, it, it, I don't give a shit why you, you're having a hard time with this. You got to be there for your partner. If you want them to be there for you, that's not a good idea for you. <laughs> You'll pay for that and, uh, and nearly as you should. But just think about it. Do you want her to do the same? Mm -hmm. And if you don't, you can't. Well, that gets to your Anchor Island wave thing. Because, and you can explain that in a second, but just quickly, if, if someone's an island, they might like to have surgery alone, <laughs> right? They might, they might. Um, but they also, islands are, um, are, are needy little buggers and they don't know they are. Um, they okay, have so hang on, but needs. pause, because that was where I was going to. <laughs> okay. in island anchor wave, and you've got the best metaphors that are so simple and Awesome, uh, Stan. Thank you. So, but just give a give the ten second um, definition, if you will, please, for island anchor wave, and why do we need to know about? Okay, so so anchor means secure, autonomous means that in my currently in my relationships with primary with people who I depend on, in some manner, those relationships I feel safe. I feel safe and secure. Ongoing, ongoing ongoing right um i do ne i never feel threatened in the safety area or the security area in terms of the relationship that's what it means and that gives me freedom to do a lot of things it frees up resources i'm not burdened by this buzz of anxiety will the relationship exist tomorrow will i be thrown out will i lose my partner any of that right so that's secure Insecure is, is gradations other than that, right? I don't feel as secure in the relationship. Either on one side, on the distancing side, and the reason I use it, I, I globally call it a distancing group because theoretically we can fit, uh, we can fit in other, other theories of personality uh, in, in that group. We hang can on, find... hang on. I feel like I'm getting confused about anchor now going into insecure, insecure and distancing. Is it a different kind of anchor or what do you mean? Ah, in, in, so anchors are secure. Another way of saying secure. Then there's in, they're insecure groups. So if we look at it in, in a linear way, which it's not, but 
just schematically, a linear way, um, you have this group, this grouping of secure that has a, ba a wide bandwidth. And then if you're looking at like hues of color, right, color, let's say going bl more and more blue, that's on the distancing side from very light blue secure to darker blue insecure, it's crossing the line there. And, and now as in that group, I, I am afraid in general of being smothered, uh, um, being used, um, being interfered with, being co-opted, um, exploited. I'm, um, I feel that my stuff is going to be stolen. I can't be myself with you because if I am, I'll lose you. If you really know how I think, I'd lose you, right? So I hide, I fly under the radar, I comply, I act as if I am going to do things, but I am passive aggressive by definition. And I'm going to, I'll comply, I'll satisfy you, but I'm resenting you for it. And I'll do what I want under the radar. I have to go outside of our orbit to feel like I'm myself again. I can't be myself because I don't have boundaries, right? That started very early in life. And so I, I have not developed into a real self that can activate myself and say, no, but how about this, right? I flee. My only, my only defense is to run away, right? So I'm conflict avoidant. I don't want conflict. I don't want you to, to um, uh, uh, you know, uh, find out all the things I think about because they're hostile. Uh, um, so painful. I mean, just to listen this to you. This sounds like, like an island. If I just that's did yes. That's an island. Okay, so that's all right. So we've gone from anchor, and like you say, it's kind of a continuum into the into the island, and right. all who's of that really painful who's... stuff right. that you do. As an island, I was neglected as a mm -hmm. child in an attachment area, so not material, right? And and because I didn't get things, I don't know what I'm missing. So I get together with you and you expect all these things as you got more than I did. And I think there's a problem with you because, hey, why are you so needy? We didn't have to do that. I, I was trained early, early. Like when we study babies, we see it in the infant right away, right away. I give up things. I stop doing things because of the, the, the thousands of interactions going on between me and my caregivers that are telling me this is how we do things here. We don't do things that way. And so I will stop uh, proximity seeking. I'll stop um, clinging. I get it. Don't be needy. Don't cling, uh, right? Play by yourself. Build a bomb in your room if you want. Um, just don't bother me. By the way, I actually, I actually made that joke and I actually came across one gentleman oh, who shit. did build a bomb in his room. Oh, frick. Uh, well, I grew up around no, a lot of rednecks and those... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I grew up around a lot of rednecks, and those boys were building pipe bombs in their rooms. Yeah, <laughs> very were, real redneck were, thing to do. They were such easy kids, though. You know, they're so, <laughs> they're so quiet and so easy, and, and never a problem. So we've got anchor. Great. I, I, let Let's sign up for Secure. the being the anchor, so, right? So we, so we have a pin in it. This started with islands being very needy. Islands okay, being needy. Just so we know. That's okay. where we started. Okay. Uh huh. Waves are on the other side of the spectrum. We can, can consider clingy based on what we see with babies. Um, these children are <clears throat> basically were expected to give up their exploring the non-caregiver world by staying dependent, young, sweet, cute, and, and not in nearby the caregiver right? They were discouraged from separating and individuating, whereas the island was encouraged to separate and individuate too early and was discouraged from clinging, which is an essential, essential part of, of becoming independent, right? I only become independent because I was fused with you. I was merged with you, right? And I wasn't threatened in any way by going away from you or clinging to you. No consequences either way. So I developed naturally. All right. So the waves are held in and take care of me. So the wave child has feels they have to take care, regulate 
the parent's emotional state, whereas on the island side, their their sense of self, self-esteem is being regulated, right? Different. One's cold, one's hot. Okay, hang on. So you're saying nope. that the the uh, wave feels like they need to take care of the parent. They, there's a parent that they f- often, not always, but often, a parent that they that is depressed, anxious, preoccupied, mm-hmm. drunk, drug addicted, oh, God. mentally ill, <laughs> oh, uh, depressed. Hey, hey, uh, Stan, get out of my head. <laughs> <laughs> well, I so mean, if let's, it's let's really not we're... funny, but I but I appreciate the the levity. Sometimes. What do we 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 laugh at at the things that are our hardest and darkest? Yep. We gotta laugh, and it's, I mean, and it's ubiquitous, and it's and it's it's normal. In the sense that it exists everywhere, but go on. So, so let's say that we've got um, a wave and an anchor, and they're in a relation, a romantic relationship, a, a marriage, and they're arguing. What would be kind of what would tip you off that this is a dynamic that's happening between these two? By the way, they talk, how they move, what they complain about, mm-hmm. uh, the manner in which they interact under stress tells me right away. So, what does so an, what does an island do that raises their island flag to you? Um, they are generally uh, quieter. Uh, their face is not as expressive. They don't signal very much. They learned early not to signal a whole lot. They keep their cards close to their chest. They're very careful about what they say. They'll start to slow down when asking to explain themselves or how they really feel because anything I say can and will get me into trouble. See, um, So I have secrets. Um, I, I tend to... Um, act compliant. I want to be a good patient so I can get out of here. I, the last thing I want is you to turn your attention towards me. So anything you want me to do, I'll do because I'm with this. This is really great. Or I'm the opposite. I think you're, uh, I think this is a colossal waste of my time. I think you're a charlatan. I think this doesn't exist. I think I, I'm happy if my partner's happy. The only reason I'm here is because they're not happy. I'm so fine. it's usually a wave that brings the couple to you. So, so it, it, rather than rather than make it these extremes, there there's there's all in between, all in between, and so it it could be a secure individual that's picked somebody who's too distancing or too clinging, right? Um, but usually, once they're in a relationship, the system starts reacting to itself, and we have another problem. And that is that they're amplifying because they're threatening each other. They're amplifying each other's fears and memory systems because insecure attachment is a memory or set of memories that that come up when I depend on you. I start to remember what happens when I depend on a person. I know I'm going to be abandoned. I know I'm going to be withdrawn from. I know you're going to stop loving me. I know you're going to, uh, uh, right? And I'm going to test you, test you, test you, test you, test you all the time, because I, I, I can't, I can't activate myself to grab what I want. I have to wait for it to come to me, which makes me a very angry person if I'm a wave, or I know I'm going to be smothered. I know I'm going to have my freedom taken from me. I know I'm going to have to, you know, take care of this person who seems now too needy, um, right? It's I'm with somebody irrational. You know, so all of these fears come up as defenses and and those defenses definitely look threatening to another person whether they're whether an uh, anchor island dog or cat doesn't matter threatening that that compels the other person to respond in kind to the defense as threatening which amplifies the other person's feeling i was right this is going to happen right and they start to amplify each other uh, because they don't know any better. They don't understand. It becomes right? self-fulfilling and other-fulfilling. Yes. yes, because people are, are, you know, most of us are just human. We're not paid to do this job. We're not paid to, to understand who we're with. We just think they're dangerous. They're unreasonable, right? So that's why most relationships will fail over time because of this thing. Um, we're not very good at, uh, most of us, at being so uh, socially, emotionally intelligent and developed as to be able to operate in a two-person system of cooperation and collaboration, right? So is there one thing, since we got to wrap up, 
Is there one thing? No, I'm just I know we started. started. <laughs> I know. Well, you're going to come back. We we want you back again and again. Please say yes. Um, we talked. We talked about at the beginning, uh, getting to the end of your rope. How, is there one thing? If if it was like if everybody <laughs> listening and watching could just do one <laughs> thing to prevent getting to the end of your rope, is there one thing? And I know it's not a silver bullet. By the way, just to be fair, it doesn't fix everything. But is there just like a hack that you're like, you know what? I like your chances if you're willing just to do this one thing. And maybe you're like, you listen, there's just not one thing, Andrea. You're you're asking the wrong question. You know what? There is no hack for that because by that time, hacks were would have been good earlier. No, no, no. I'm talking I, not if you're at the end of your rope. I'm saying for people that are kind of well, I thought you said through, if you're at the end of your rope. Yeah, yeah. Not if you're at the you know, like we're we're pe- yeah. So let me rewind. For people, how to start are, at the beginning of the rope. Right. Yeah. Beginning of the rope. If you're at the beginning of your rope, then is there something that you would just say, listen, you know, nobody gets paid for this. It's hard. Most relationships fail. Here's the one thing I urge everybody to do. And then then your chances improve. Is there a thing? You just gave me a you just gave me a wonderful metaphor in terms of tying the knot. Tying the knot is your two rope, both your ropes, but your ropes are together because you you friggin organized this. You didn't just assume you were on the same page. You didn't assume that you were um, that you in visual that you visualize the same idea, right? You didn't do that. You actually you actually talked about why are we not just what are we, but also why are we? It cannot be about love. It cannot be about anything emotional. It has to be about purpose. What purpose do we serve? What are we going to do for each other? That is going to be so impressive, so wonderful, because the world will never do it, that we will do this because we agree, right? The bar is set higher than the average. Okay, pair, so just so right? give me one example, you know, whether it's in your life or or yeah. you know, a client or so forth, you know, a young couple, they're, you know, they're still in bliss. What would that purpose look like? Because I think a lot of people listening to this book, I don't even know what he's talking about now. Like, I thought the whole point was love. So if it's not love and it must be about purpose, then what would an agree, like one line agreement look like? Our relationship comes first above and beyond everyone and everything because everyone and everything depends on us being in good shape, happy, happy. We're the leaders, we're the big bosses, we're in charge of everyone, kids included. If we aren't good, nothing is. Every, everything else uh, suffers. Yes. Yeah. And, if, and you, if you make it about romance and love, then the moment the romance fizzles, you lose your mission. Lose my mission because I'm, I'm, I, we're, we're actually planning for our devils, not our angels, because I may not like you uh, this particular day. But am I going to do what I said? Because that was the best thing we we decided to do. It was at the right thing we decided. We decided, right? Nobody else. Because we're expecting to come through when we least want to do it. Least want to do it. Therefore, it better be, you know, it better be something we both believe in because we've created this thing in our own heads. It does not exist. We've made it up. We've made it up. That makes it greater than us. Well, let's protect that idea which and is, let's not screw up. Yeah, which is, I mean, I'm going to say this because I love you. It's radical and it's obvious, but so few people do it, right? I mean, that's the point that I feel like it's like having, being that intentional. To me, it's like, hello, why doesn't everybody do that? I mean, I'm not it's, asking you to answer that, but I do love that. It blows my mind because yeah. two Only things that Stan has told you and me, Andrea, in the past too, is it can't be about having kids together because then you can't complain when the sex and romance is gone and what happens when they grow up. And it can't be about romance and sexual attraction because that is never going to be consistently there every single day over 40, 50 years. And it is revolutionary because I know when I, 20 years ago, when I made that commitment, I definitely was thinking romance. I'm going to be in love forever. And it's like, it's not realistic. 
You can agree on a principle that we do romantic things for each other throughout every day. We do it, right? That could give rise to feeling romantic, right? Because of what you are going to do. So it's about social contracts. Only in couples do we not make social contracts. You would never do that if you were joining a dance troupe, a rock and roll band that was serious. You wouldn't, you start a business that, hey, um, Andrew, I just fell in love with you. Let's start a business. Yeah, right. No, nobody yeah. does that, right? <laughs> Ding dongs do that. Nobody's smart. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody does that. No, I got yeah. you. That's why it's radical and obvious, Stan. Like, props for that. Okay, we got to wrap up. You are amazing. I do love you. I really so love are you. you. Thank Both you. you. I love spending so much time with you. And then Miss Byron, where'd you go, Byron? I, Brian, Brian. Well, I was going to yeah. pull him Brian, in hi. because he's about to get married in the next, what, year or two. So he's just starting. He's at the well, beginning. Well, we're just getting of engaged. Calm yeah, we're just down. getting engaged. So right. we're going to have to. But I do believe you get engaged to get married. But they've been working on a very functional relationship for a long time. But he's right there. Andrea and I are 20 plus okay, years. Real, real quickly, real quickly. Byron, you said so you, you used Brian, the qualifier. Brian, Brian, Brian. By, yes. Byron, Byron, so, Brian, Brian, um, Brian, Brian, <laughs> Brian, Brian. Oh my God, it's my dyslexia. It's the O. It, it messes all everyone. The time. It messes it's the I didn't know I had. Okay, Brian. <laughs> um, use the qualifier. We're getting engaged. Are you engaged or are you not? Um, here, I'll I'll give you a little spoiler because I know um, she doesn't watch that's, the show. That's a deflection. Oh, oh hey. And we are seeing we are seeing a gorgeous ring here, people. For you who oh, wow. that see is it, so... who are not watching this, you're seeing a gorgeous oh, ring my God. and a man who is so delighted because he picked out the perfect ring. It is bliss on his face. Good job, Brian. Yes, we, no, we, we no, it went from bliss to a little bit of fear. I'm looking at his face. No, right now. no, no, no. Uh, um, like a little fear there. Um, no, okay. we're very excited. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank so you, you. Oh, that you're you're a, a great guy. You Aww, really are. Shut. And they're doing it like millennials where they've discussed it. They've made plans together. It's not a huge surprise where she might say no. Uh, and it, that to me seems so healthy, you know, like yeah. they're on the same page. She's she's a little bit on the older end of Gen Z. And um, but no, she makes jokes all the time like, wow, my my hand is feeling really light. Like, uh, oh, that's cute. And that's cute. um. You should, give, yeah, no. you should have a joke giver like a really like a lead, a yeah, lead like ring, a ring pop, yeah, yeah. Um, but so she's really into sustainability and and circularity. So we wanted to um, get a ring that like she's really into Art Deco. So we got a one that was from the twenties and wanted to to basically like keep one in circulation instead of putting a new one out That's there. That's so, so cool, Brian. And I, 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 I guess cool. I am a romantic. When are you asking her? Uh, so I don't know the exact date yet. Um, I, I want to plan something a little bit. Key. She doesn't want anything like super over the top, not like a restaurant where we're like, oh, they congratulate a bunch of balloons yeah, and then confetti. Yeah, no. So something cute, low key. I don't know exactly what yet, but I kind of want to, you know, have some of her like one of her friends in on it so they can like take a, some like uh, photos like concealed or something. So I have to like plan something that's special but not like too over the top yeah all right Just well congratulations don't wait. Brian. Don't wait too long yeah that's what don't I wait oh too yeah, long. yeah. I, I mean it's burning a hole in my pocket i already bought it i mean <laughs> Well, I love the symbolism and just your thoughtfulness in picking something it, yeah. that is so, I mean, some, you know, ring, obviously a engagement ring is already symbolic, but good job doing the extra, uh, going uh, very intentionally. You're you're picking up what Stan's putting down. Very intentional. I love it. Read, we, read, we do. I'll send you a copy. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. We talked about that a little bit. I, I would love that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Okay. okay so Stan's seminal book wired for love i'm going to give a little bit more color to this for those of you who are down to buy it when it's re-released you can pre-order it now on amazon and uh, apple books and so forth it is described as the complete insider's guide to understanding your partner's brain sparking lasting connection and enjoying a romantic relationship built on love and trust and that's a long subplot it's a lot well but it's a, it's props and hundreds of thousands of copies have been sold because it's outstanding and this conversation has been outstanding oh stan thank you thank you so much oh, thank you thank you as you always i love you guys okay I don't, I'm... <laughs> come on
Okay, folks, that's a wrap. Thanks for tuning in to another amazing episode of Open Relationships Transforming Together. We are bringing this to you from our hearts. We really hope you're loving what we're doing. We welcome your feedback and advice, guests you'd like to have on, questions you'd like to ask, situationships you'd like us to explore. Please follow, like, subscribe, comment. We are so grateful to be bringing this show to you and so appreciate um, your tuning in. Uh, thanks very much. <laughs>